I think with when it comes to culture, it starts with the coaches. And, you know, I'm a big Craig Rochelle fan, and so are you. When he mentioned to, you know, on one of his podcasts about, you know, you got to coach your coaches first, that's when it all starts changing for me. Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. Today, I interview Ryan Phillips, head coach for Santa Fe High School in Edmond, Oklahoma. In 2019, Santa Fe became the 6A Oklahoma State Champions. And on the show, Ryan shares with us how he helps develop team culture, improve the confidence of players. We also get into how to develop coaches and how he adapts and makes the most of his one hour time limitations in the fall. You're going to love this episode. And here is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. It seems like we connect every couple of days, every couple of weeks, just to talk shop. And so I, I thought there would be no better guest because, I, and I probably don't know any guests better than I do with you, just because we're I constantly bug you about different things that you guys are doing. So I'm excited to get to share with the world a lot of the different things that made you guys successful this past season as the 2019 6A Oklahoma State champs. And but for our listeners who would like to get to know you a little bit on a personal level before we get into, you know, practices, design and player development. Where did you get your start in baseball? And, you know, why did you decide to get into coaching? Well, first off, it goes both ways. You know, I call you, I get good information from you as well. So I thank you for that. It's not just one sided for those that are listening, but as far as me and, and baseball, I grew up in the air force. My dad's a chaplain in the air force or was. And so, Baseball was my way to meet new people, you know, because we moved every three years or so. Mm -hmm. And so getting into baseball was something that I was decent at. I was left handed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't real fast, you know, but but I found that I, I could have success in baseball. So playing all the way from five all the way until somebody told me not to, uh, that was the way I met people. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky enough to get drafted by the Red Sox in 2004. I got married, had kids, and, and decided, you know, I'm, I'm ready to move on. And so I had two more years of school, and so I decided to try high school coaching while I was going to school because mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really know. It had been a while since I've been involved in high school sports, and so I wanted to know if that level was what I wanted to be at. And while I was going to school, I just loved it. I loved the instruction. I loved the age that the kids were at and how – uh, they're still learning at that point. They haven't, you know, in pro ball, you're kind of set and you just make a few adjustments. But in high school, you know, you can really coach a kid and, and they'll listen and you can see them develop from ninth to senior or to a senior. And so that's what I really liked. And so when I finally graduated, you know, I got right into teaching and coaching. I love that. And I love that, you know, you, you've seen every level all the way from, you know, like you mentioned, five years old to pro ball and and you came back, and we always need good high school coaches, and you're obviously one of those. And you guys had a had a great year, and you know, obviously, winning state title and winning the last game of the season just caps off an unbelievable run that you guys had. But we've been talking about some different things that you guys are going to be doing this fall. And here in Oklahoma, we get an hour a day the entire fall mm -hmm. until December first to be able to develop our players, and that's actual just baseball training. So let's talk about what right. this upcoming fall is going to look like for you and just kind of go through a typical week for us. Okay. Well, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how here at Santa Fe, we're lucky enough to have a, a weightlifting class. And so that helps us a little bit in the fall because I think weight training is very important. You can see it everywhere. You know, pro guys do it. College guys do it. They're doing it the day of or they're doing it after a game or whatever. So that right there helps me as a head coach because, that takes 
that out of my practice plan. I don't have to worry about it. It's something that I know it's there. I know we're going to be able to do it. And we have a weight training coach and Joe Peeler, and, and he's really good at it. He, he loves baseball. He's good at football, soccer. He's very, he's very good at, at making lists or, or programs for specific sports. And so in the fall, we lift pretty heavy. We condition quite a bit during second hour. But as far as baseball goes, the fall planning starts now, really, with our, and it started right after the season because, you know, as a high school, as a high school coach, once your season's over, seniors are gone, and then you start evaluating your next year's class or next year's team. And so what we do here is constantly throughout the summer, okay, we got this kid, we got this kid, and he's doing good this summer, he's, he's doing all right this summer, or he's growing this summer. And so we base our fall off of our next year's team. It's not the same every year because this last year we had a lot of speed, okay? Mm-hmm. And so we worked on base running a lot. And then we had some guys in the middle lineup that had power. And, you know, and so base running was, was a big part of our fall. And it will be this next year, but we might focus more on reps, on ground balls, defense, outfield work, or whatever. So a typical week for us is based on our personnel. And I think if, if you can do that, or and we've just noticed from past experiences that that works best for us, not just teaching the same way every time. Mm-hmm but going with the personnel that we have. Sure. And so you're essentially building your team around the talent that you've got. And, you know, you obviously have a system that that you're working within, but you can't do things if they can't do them. And I, I really like that because all of us would like to just throw fuzz and hit dingers all the time. But, you know, we, <laughs> right. we've got who we've got. So you mentioned that right. base running was obviously a big part of that. Just take us through how you guys teach it and some different things that you guys do. Well, I think if you're not teaching the on-base use style, you're a little behind. You know, we we were lucky enough to hear him talk at clinic. I have a really good uh, assistant coach in Roma Cesar, and I let him kind of head the way on base running. But, you know, without giving out all our secrets, because I'm sure there's Oklahoma coaches here listening, but, <laughs> you know, we do a lot of timing. We steal a lot of bases off not just the pitcher, but the catcher. We look at tendencies on how they're pitching guys. We look at the timing, you know, in, at our level, high school level, some guys getting rhythms and, and it's the time to, the time to run. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at all aspects, not just does he have a quick pickoff move Mm -hmm. or is he only picking on the second pitch or whatever. We're trying to look at all aspects and we're willing to take a risk in it. Also, part of that is not getting mad at your guys if they get thrown out because we're, we're trying to teach aggression. Now, there's a there's a not good time to go, but if they're trying to go and, and it's a good read and the, the catcher just makes a good throw or picks it and throws them out, you know, mm-hmm. that's part of it. You can't get mad at them if you want to be aggressive like we want, but it doesn't work out. Completely understand that. And, you know, we, we talk about aggression a lot, and then you see the kids getting blown up for getting thrown out. And maybe they got a bad jump. Mm-hmm. Maybe they weren't supposed to. But in the end, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of that's on us if we're saying one thing and not mm-hmm. doing that. So I, I, I love that right. that you make sure that, that that is a point that you guys make. So we've got five days in the fall. And how many of those, just if you don't mind, you know, do you guys have a set schedule of like we do this Monday, Wednesday, Friday? We do this Tuesday, Thursday. This is how our hour is spent. And honestly, yeah. I, I just love to hear advice on how coaches are spending their their time and how much time they're spending on what because we all do it a little bit differently but if there's a way that we can mm-hmm. get more out of five to ten minutes here and there then our players are going to get better so what are you guys what are you guys looking like okay so here's what we do so in this fall it'll be similar okay but we play cat we stretch do our bands do our you know our normal arm care stuff and then we play catch and then after catch is when we did our base running so we did base running every day right after catch. And that was, in, and I gave Coach RC five to 10 minutes, mm-hmm. depending on what he was, what we were going over. And we do it all together. So 12th through ninth grade, because we want them all to look the same. All our coaches are out there that we have available. They're out there with us doing base running because, you know, JV is being coached by somebody different and freshmen is being coached by somebody different. But we want them to hear all the same verbals and nonverbal or see the nonverbals and, and all that. So 
So we'd spend five, 10 minutes on base running, and then we might do it a little different than everybody else. But after that, we probably have 35 to 40 minutes, right, after catch and and the base running. So what I will do, since I'm the infield, I'm the defensive coach for our staff. Our C's our hitting coach. Coach Teal's our pitching and catching. Catchers will go with Coach Teal. Let's say on a Monday, we'll go with Coach Teal. RC has either our our younger guy. We call them the younger guys. We'll split them into two groups, and then I'll have everybody else. And that's all we have for the whole day. I just find it more efficient when we're not transitioning from, you know, kind of like a rotation. Because mm-hmm. with the hour long time, you know, that's a five to ten minute window where they're they're transitioning, especially sure. at our indoor when you have to take your cleats off you know, put your flats on and and whatnot. So I'll spend all Monday with the older infielders and outfielders and we'll run through drills. We'll try to go some live stuff, you know, with me hitting fungo and a a base runner running, or we'll just break it down and get some cones or ladders and work on ground balls, work on some angles for the outfielders, whatever it is. I'm just focusing on those guys. Sure. And in the fall, I probably have 15 guys in that older group. Mm-hmm. And then there's another 15 to 20 in the younger group. And then Tuesday, we'll do the same thing. Catch, base running, but then I'll have the other guys. Gotcha. Catchers probably won't go two days in a row. So Coach Teal will either be with me on infield and outfield or inside with Coach RC. Mm-hmm. And I think that's best for us. It works best for us because we get to really focus in on that one thing for that day. Mm-hmm. And then we're just recording it as we go. Okay, so we've spent so many days on base running, so many days on ground balls, so many days on double cuts, you know, and, and so we're recording it. And so then the next week we adjust. Sure. You know, maybe PFPs are in there when catchers aren't working and coach deals with me. And so we just try to be efficient. And I think if I can just keep a group for that 35 minutes, and it's not a small group, but it's enough to build a team and you can do team stuff with mm-hmm. as long as. I have 35 minutes with them. I really think we can get stuff done more than I could with 10, 15 minutes. Right. Right. I I like that a lot. And again, like you mentioned, if you're transitioning from one to another, you get an hour, you're going to lose five minutes doing that. And you know, I, I, you get to actually focus and simplify some different things that you're doing instead of worrying about ground balls and then running inside, putting on your turfs, getting your bat, getting everything. And that just, that makes a ton of sense to me. Exactly. And when the kids come in, they see the practice plan. We have a TV that we get to project it on from my Mm -hmm. computer screen. And when they see, okay, I'm outside. So I'm just bringing my glove and my cleats. You know, we're wearing pants Mm -hmm. and they can focus on it. You know, we journal on a, on a daily basis. So if, if we're journaling before practice, which we usually don't in the fall, because again, that's not very efficient with our hour, Mm -hmm. they're journaling after, but at least they know that the next day, they're going to be probably inside hitting or something to do with offense. Sure. And so they get the gist of the, of the schedule. So one week, they're Monday, Wednesday field work or out on the field and Tuesday, Thursday hitting. Mm-hmm. And, and then the other week, they're the opposite. Cause on Fridays, we just do team competitions. We kind of get away from it, you know, and we try to have fun with them and, and make the game fun. And it's, it's not just baseball. Like we'll go out there and we'll play dodgeball or we'll go, tug of war i don't know we'll, we do a lot of different team comps we play locker room basketball our locker room's big enough to where we got teams and they go after it and i think it's a good break for them in the fall for sure uh, i understand that completely and you you guys play competitions on fridays and i'm sure that that's part of the culture that you're trying to build a competitive culture but what are some different right. things that you guys do and you've been there for you know this isn't obviously your first year so you're continuing to build on the culture that you have and and again, you, you mm-hmm. win state, you're doing a lot of things right, but how are you continuing to build your culture and shape it over time? And I guess, really, how have you done it up to this point? And what are some different things that you have made important to you? What things have you made that are important to you, important to them? You probably know this because me and you talk, but here's where I think it all starts. I think it starts with the coaching staff. When the boys can see that the coaching staff gets along now, it's not every day, you know, family fights or whatever. But when you can see that, that our families are family, um, I really care about all my assistant coaches. You know, there's guys that coach JV and, and freshmen, but that doesn't mean the freshman coach can't suggest something to me and us for varsity. If you came to the state tournament this last year, our freshman coach is in there 
and he suggests certain things, you know, and, and one time he suggested something and we hit a home run with the pitch hitter and, you know, it works. Nice. And so I think with, when it comes to culture, it starts with the coaches and, you know, I'm a big Craig Rochelle fan and so are you. And I feel like I get a lot of stuff from him and his is not necessarily with sports teams. It's, it's a little bit different. It's more business related advice, mm-hmm. but it's still managing people. And so when he's mentioned to, you know, on one of his podcasts about, you know, you got to coach your coaches first, that's when it all started changing for me. And I didn't start doing that until my second or third year here. And I just got done with my six. So mm-hmm. over the last three years, I've been lucky enough to have the same coaching staff. Well, that's fantastic. And, and in high school, you know, that's, that's kind of rare to have it all the way up, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so when the players see that we love each other and that even though sometimes we disagree, we can get on the same page. I think that's the, that's the backbone of the culture. And then it goes down to those kids and then the coaches are coaching them, you know, and, and they're showing them love and they're showing them, they're trying to be positive. They're trying to reinforce what they're doing good. That way when something happens and they need to be criticized or something needs to be changed, their, their hearts are more welcoming for criticism. And so I guess to answer the question that we, I work really hard on the coaches mm-hmm. and, and then the coaches really help me with the players all the way up. And something I do by myself as the head coach is, um, and I started doing this three years ago as well. Um, I have a roster. It's on my whiteboard in my office, and my office is facing the whiteboard. And it has a list of seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. It has the whole program, every okay. kid in there. Mm-hmm. And something I used to have to do when I just started this was, to, you know, so I could stay consistent with it. But I picked two kids out on that roster. And I go any time of the day, you know, it might be during second hour, during weightlifting. It might be before practice, during practice, after practice, whatever. I just ask them how they're doing or I ask them something non-baseball related. And by the end of it, when I have, you know, I have 40 kids. So once you get once, a, and it's not just the varsity players, it's freshman players, it's, it's soft, it's JV players, it's all of them. That builds that relationship, I think, because, Freshman kids are, are probably pretty intimidated by any head coach to start with, most of them. And so when you're sitting there just asking them how they're, how they're doing or what do they like to do outside of baseball, I think that that builds that family atmosphere to where, hey, this isn't life or death. You know, mm-hmm. I have kids, you have brothers and sisters, you have the age, this age that they're at. It can't just be about baseball sure. because if it is the game of failure, they're going to feel like failures. And so that's the culture we bring. And I, and me personally, I try to do that. And since I've done it for three years now, I don't have to have the roster in front of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just look at the names. I'm like, Oh, I asked him yesterday how he was doing. Or I asked him how he was doing. I asked him how his brother and sisters were or his dad or, or whatever, you know, and it changes. I changed my questions. I, Sometimes I go up and joke about them or just, you know, or tell a joke or something. It doesn't matter. But as long as I'm talking to them and it's not just a random kid that I don't get to know, I think anytime you get to know your kids, freshman all the way up, that's investing in the future, even if he's not playing varsity right now. I like that a lot. And for our listeners who may be listening with a smaller roster, I mean, the reason that you have these rosters is because you may have 40, 50 kids in the off season or during the season mm-hmm. trying to do this. And, you know, as, as much as we like to believe, and you've obviously gotten this mastered, but I would have to do the same thing, is we inevitably will skip a kid or two, and, and it sounds like that's something right. that's really important for you not to do. And, and I really like that a lot. I, that's something that I try to do during catch play every day in our throwing program yep. is we want it to be important to them so that I make sure and try and get out there as much as I can, and I probably need to do a better job of that. But you've mentioned several times that you really like to coach your coaches and you know I'm really curious how do you do that and is it just a one-on-one conversation do you make it like a weekly conversation with everyone or just kind of take us through your process of what that looks like for you when we're coaching coaching coaches all of them have a good base of baseball you know and all of them love the game of baseball that's part of the reason they've, they've stuck around and that's part of the reason they're coaching high school sports and are probably the main reason. But when I'm when I'm trying to help a coach, 
I try to give him more responsibility, you know, and, and when he comes with responsibility, a lot of the times they surprise me and they do a really good job or they, they do something that I'm like, I don't think I would have done that, but it worked. And so that helps it actually, when I'm trying to coach them by giving them more responsibility or, or just giving them more tasks, they actually coach me a little bit. And so it's a give, give, but if they aren't being successful in something or if they're struggling with something, or if I, you know, I, I let them talk in front of our players last year, I had our pitching coach do a PowerPoint for the pitchers. I had our hitting coach do one for the hitters and they both got up there and spoke. Um, they created their own PowerPoint. You know, of course, I, we went over it together, but when they presented it, it was their PowerPoint. And I just think when you when you allow them to do that stuff, it creates ownership, gives them a chance to, uh, okay, like this is my baby. This is, this is my time to talk and this is my time to be a part of this, to include myself into this and, and have like that sense of feeling. Like when we won the state championship, I think every coach we had, felt like a big part of it. Sure. Um, awesome. And so that's, that's my goal. So when I'm coaching my coaches, I really try to delegate in areas that they can be successful at. And, and sometimes I miss, sometimes a lot of the times I don't because all they need is a little bit of confidence in themselves and, and they're all good people. The like coaches I have, they're all good guys and they all really want to work hard. And mm -hmm. so that's, that makes it easier for me to trust them. Sure, but I just sit back and watch, and and then then we kind of talk about it. It's not like I sit down and grade them, you know. But here and there, I'd be like, "Hey, don't forget to do this, or don't forget to say that," and it just goes. It's a continual thing, right? And you're by giving them responsibility, you're not only showing, you know, you're trusting them, but you're also getting some stuff off of your plate. Which you know, the more head coaches that I get to interview who do a really good job of delegating, that's something that they've had to learn and hire good guys to yeah. be able to do that. But, you know, as an assistant coach, anytime that our head coach gives me responsibility or gives different assistants responsibility, we take ownership of that. And that's something that we pride mm -hmm. ourselves in as just assistant coaches in general. And yeah. so I, I'm always, I love hearing about different competitions that people are doing. And since you already told us about your Friday competitions, what are some different things that you guys do in a baseball setting just to make practice more competitive? John, we, everything we do, you have a winner and a loser. Okay. So it starts with catch. You know, we, we do our throwing program and I, and, and throwing program is really important to me as a pitcher being, that being my background. Playing catch is very important. I don't really like too much messing around. I don't like any of that. Even, you know, we do the Jaeger band stuff, but you know, even that, you know, is out of my comfort zone because everybody's at a different length. You know, everybody's at a different part or going further. Some are going further than others and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. that kind of bugs me with my OCD. But recently, I've kind of just, I have to let go a little bit. I mean, at the end of catch, we're playing 21 or 11, whatever number we set on them. And the loser has to tell the other guy he's better than them or he has to do push-ups or, you know, our, our strength and conditioning coach makes them do five jumping jacks, yelling, I'm a star or whatever, nice. you know, just something, something they don't want to do right but but it's not too bad you know it just creates competition and then as far as infield goes you know we will do our reps we'll go through our routine and then at the end there'll be last man standing right well you have any kind of bobble you have any doesn't matter if you get a bad hop or not if you have any bobble you're out it could be your first ground ball so if you want more ground balls you know you put that little pressure on them they got to make the throw you know so they got to field it cleanly make the throw First baseman sometimes help them out. But if you want to stay in the game, you can't mess up. You can't mess up at all. You got to be perfect, basically. And then outfielders, we're doing drills and you have to turn and throw and hit a screen. If you don't hit it, we got running, you know? And so anything we're doing, we have a winner and a loser. We have the last guy standing. We have one on one competitions in the weight room. We do that as far as cone drills and when we're doing sprints. And I think that that just creates it. It's not like a cut, it's not cutthroat, mm -hmm. but anytime, you know, you're just like, crap, I got to compete. I'm competing again. I'm competing again. Like, you know, and you win some that day, sometimes you lose and you get to really see who your competitors are Sure. by who hates to lose. You know, sometimes you got to teach a kid, Hey, this is, this is not how you act when you lose, like calm down. It's not, you know, have a little perspective, but sometimes you're like, Hey, you just got beat five times in a row. Like, mm -hmm. are you going to, you're going to get a little pissed off or you're just going to take it. 
you know, and so you kind of learn stuff about their personalities, but, and, and how they're acting that day. And, and you get to see who's consistent and who's not. Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. And again, I think I like it from a competitive aspect, obviously, but I also like it from mm-hmm. a deliberate practice because once right. you put a number on something that's meaningful to you, or you say mm-hmm. that you're going to see the measuring stick with you and somebody else, it obviously heightens awareness. You get that full attention from that person. And, and that's besides the competitive aspect and seeing who your competitors are, then I think that that mm-hmm. also helps with, again, deliberate practice and attention. And we don't have them for a long time in the fall, especially, but what can we do with that hour right. and how, how deliberate can we make it? And I think that that's a big part of it. Us coaches in Oklahoma and, and other states, obviously, that have similar restrictions, the hour-long practice, a lot of people don't like it. And, and of course, you'd like that a little bit longer, but it's made us more creative. Oh, absolutely. You know, and more efficient. It's made me be more efficient, and you really kind of prioritize even more on what you need. So being able to to be competitive and get what you wanted out of practice, like as far as drills and execution and stuff all at once, it's actually forced me to be a better coach. No, for sure. And I know we gripe about it, but I think probably mm-hmm. more than 50% of our guests don't get their players until January or sometimes February. <laughs> and I just, mm-hmm. man, I, I don't know if I could coach somewhere like that just because I love the fall so much because we get do get to have that player development aspect. And we do, I mean, when do we get to know them any better than we do right. in the fall just because we do have right. a little bit of downtime. And I don't know right. if this if this question necessarily is a great one for you, but I also, I think that it's a really good one. But you also said mm-hmm. that you hadn't had any turnover in your staff in three years, but do you get to, you obviously get to assist in the hiring process. And whenever you're, mm-hmm. whenever you're looking over candidates and whenever you have them in for an interview, is there any questions that you ask or any any things that you do to try and figure out who that person really is? Yeah, I mean, constantly. You know, I have to hire some guys in the summer, you know, but they're not necessarily on our spring staff, just depending on summer baseball. But And that's even kind of going away. But, like, on my staff right now, I have guys that are younger than me and guys that are older than me and one that's about my age. And so when I got to Santa Fe, I got to bring R.C. with me from Southmore. I had a position for him and, you know, and he's kind of been my right hand guy. But other than that, I have two guys that have played for me. And so when I'm, when I'm looking at my players and guys that I could hire, it's not necessarily, actually, it's not at all about if you're the best player. It's, do you love the game? Are you willing to learn? And how do you relate to the kids? So those are my three things that I go by as far as coaches go. And, you know, I have some guys that are older than me. They're not old, but they're older than me. But all three of them, one of them has a kid in the program. One of them is about to have a kid that's in high school. And then the other one, the kids just love him. I love him. He he coaches multiple sports and both sports love him. And so when I'm looking at a staff, that's what I want. I want guys that not necessarily friends, like, you you know, there's a fine line and being friends with the kids and whatnot, but I want to coaches that can relate to the kids aren't, you know, aren't from the stone age and, but also get the respect from them because of how hard they work and the kids can see if you want to be there or not, you know? And so I know you can't really tell that before you hire them, but if you, if you have the chance to do the research on the guy or call somebody, like if I was calling coach Newkirk about you, you know, those are questions I would ask Mm -hmm. and I'd hire you in a heartbeat, but (laughs) <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Those are the things that I would that I look for. Well, I really like that a lot, and I think that you're right. There's no better street cred than the than what you get from your players because I, they see you every day, and what yeah. we say and and how we act. I mean, they can tell pretty quickly whether that lines up into who we truly are. And kids are really really good at that, and that's something that that I've consistently worked on myself for ever since I got into coaching is because I. I was a player once and I knew when a coach was just saying something for us to do and not living it out himself. So that's something that I'm trying to live out every single day. And if I'm asking our players to get better then I better be, and which is one, you know, big reason that I started the podcast, but you've talked yeah. a lot, a lot about your players and I, I love that. And you can obviously tell you have a heart for them, but do you guys have any rules or standards that you have in your program? And I know that you do, 
But what, you know, mm-hmm. take us through what those are and then, you know, how you make those important to your players as well. Okay. So our standards are pretty simple and they're consistent year to year uh, since I've been here. And really, it's just two things. We And I've even heard it from other coaches on your podcast. And I think it, it covers pretty much, this one covers pretty much everything. But our first standard is you got to do what's right. And that's that's for your family, at school, that's in baseball. You know, and if you're just doing what's right, those side distractions that you get, you know, as a, as a coach are minimized. They're not always going to do things that's right, you know. And so... Once you realize that, we go to our next one and we learn from failure. You know, Augie Garrido, those are his rules. You know, you got to do what's right and you got to learn from failure. And if you can do those, then, you know, you're going to be okay. And so that's kind of what we go by. And learning from failure has been huge for us this last year because we got stomped early. But the way you learn from it is is your perspective on what happened. You know, you got to understand it's baseball. You got to understand you know, the age of the kids and, and everything. Mm-hmm. And so not only they had to learn, but we had to learn that, you know, just because we lose early doesn't mean that's how it's always going to be because we felt pretty good about our team. But as long as we're doing things right and, and and we get really detailed, we do small things, right? Like we have chairs in our locker room and you saw the Vanderbilt guys doing it after their mm-hmm. press conference. But like, that's something we always do. Like they can't start practice at their chairs or, not back where they're supposed to go. We don't walk on the grass. We have sidewalk that goes from our field to the, to our indoor. You know, I I make them stay on the sidewalk. I make them jog. Once they come out of the, um, once they come out of the locker room, we get on the field, we're jogging everywhere. We don't walk anywhere. Our freshman locker room and sophomore locker room are behind third base. When they come out, they're jogging over to the first base dugout. And so like we have those, but when it comes down to it, if they're just doing what's right, picking up trash, picking up your teammates, doing good in school, treating your family right, representing them right, that adds to our culture. And, and the standards, just it kind of just falls in line with culture for us. I like that a lot. And, you know, that, that takes me back to the state tournament when you guys came and hit at our place. After you left, mm-hmm. everything was cleaned up. And what something that I noticed... And, it's something that was small, but all of your players came up and shook all of our coaches' hands and told them thank you for letting them yeah. hit. And we're like, dude, you guys are in freaking state tournament. You're welcome. You know, obviously, <laughs> go win it. But right. you know, it, it was something that even our head coach mentioned that after they left, he said, you know, every one of their every one of their players came up and shook our hands and told us thank you for letting us hit and and all of that. And and so. Obviously, cool. you didn't have to say anything that day, or we would right. have noticed. But it's right. just part of the culture right. that you're building there, and part of you know the culture that that is currently obviously still standing. Yeah, and you know, and the kids learned. They've learned that from my assistant coaches. You know, like after they, and and I know you guys do this too, but and a lot of people do. But after you hit BP, you, you tell the coach thank you. You know, like because he didn't have to. You didn't have to throw to him. You know, our coaches help big pick up the balls. They don't they don't just walk out of the cage after they throw, you know, like it's just something my assistant coaches and it goes back to just who they are as people and then, you know, just trying to coach them a little bit and also having a little bit of luck by falling into these guys. But they're showing that to those boys and then therefore they see that it's important to us. So when we're in the going into the biggest game of their life and my coaching career they're still able to do the small things. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm glad they did it. That's, I didn't know if they all did it or not. <laughs> yep, no honest. doubt, no doubt. So take us through what you guys are doing in the spring, and we could spend an entire hour talking about practice planning, but you know what's important to right. you and how does a typical practice look like in the spring for you? Obviously not on game day. Right. It's similar to fall, but more detailed. When I played something that even – you know, I was lucky enough to have Gabe Kapler as a manager and Luis Alice as a manager. One's an outfielder, one's an infielder. And then obviously I had good pitching coaches. But one thing I picked up from them is how to adjust as the season goes. And so the practice plan, it varies, you know, depending on how, how the game went. But it's not necessarily, oh, we made a mistake on PFP, so we're doing PFPs. Because 
that's kind of like that free throw effect in basketball. Crap, he just keeps missing. He keeps missing. Well, I'm going to shoot more, but then they put more emphasis on it. And then mentally the guy can't make free throws. So I don't, I, there's a fine line for me and pitchers and infielders. And I don't want to emphasize mistakes too much, basically. If it wasn't ran correctly, yeah, we're going to go back and run it. But if there's an execution thing, we might do it, but it won't be the next day, if that makes sense. Just because I'm not coddling the kid, but mm-hmm. but mental stability and mental toughness and stuff like that is important to me. And I think giving them confidence and giving them perspective on, hey, you make one mistake doesn't mean you know doesn't mean tomorrow we're going to do a hundred of these. It means we're going to cover it. We're going to make sure you can do it. It just might not be the next day. So our practice schedule, it could be from maybe something two games ago or three games ago. Or just, you know, continuing to get better at what what we're not very good at. Like last year, we just kept doing base running, kept doing base running, kept doing base and we became really good at it. We were not good at it at the beginning, even though we put so much effort into it. But then they just finally, you know, those in-game reps, the, the longer practices, we got to do a little bit more on it, you know. And so our practices are determined by how we're playing and, and, and what our team looks like. Right, right. And, you know, you being a pitching guy, everybody's a little bit different in how they make sure that they get their pins in. It's obviously Mm -hmm. a really important thing. And so when do you guys uh, throw pins and what's your advice on what those should look like? Well, uh, the throwing program we did last year, the pins actually started, well, our arms were in shape for bullpens around December. And so obviously in Oklahoma in December, it's cold. And so they're inside. And so the way we, we stay competitive inside is we're throwing live bullpens. They'll throw their 20 and 25 pitch bullpen with a header hitter standing in. I always, when I pitched, I'd rather have a hitter in there so I can get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. And it's even better knowing they're not going to swing. So you can still work on stuff. You're not worried about the results, but you get that feel of the guy in there. You know, colleges have the, those plastic guys in there or whatever. Some schools have them. We don't. We just put our hitters in there so they can also start tracking and hopefully not, you know, hopefully get the, the speed of the the game and the pitch and all and get their timing down quicker by being able to stand in bullpens. Hmm. So we'll do it as far as practice goes. We'll get our hitting out of the way. We'll throwing, stretch, throwing, hitting. If we have any drills we need to do. And then at the end of practice, we'll go live. And we're lucky enough to have five cages. Mm-hmm. So we can get three to five bullpens going at once. Sure. And so, you know, if it's warm enough outside, we'll throw part of their bullpen outside and then come in and, and throw again, you know, and throw the other half against hitters inside. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, that's just another way to stay competitive and stay and get yourself ready for the season by seeing live reps and have hitters actually swinging, you know, cause you can have a pitch that looks good with nobody in there, but mm-hmm. then, you throw it and everybody's taking good swings off of it, you know, and then you can just go back to the drawing board and and try to figure out why. Definitely. Definitely. Obviously the in game stuff is our test. And if it's not working and guys are just hitting lasers off of it, obviously the pitch isn't very good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what are you guys doing for your BP setup and what's that look like? Okay. So if you came to Santa Fe during BP and, you know, on the field, that's something we like to do. Now, we like to do it on game day. So if we're able to, we're hitting BP on the field on game days. I've never really been great at incorporating it into practice, you know, but because I don't feel like I get enough reps out of it. Now I've seen people do it really good and I know people are really good at incorporating it and, and going live and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But if you came to Santa Fe on a, on a game day for BP, I like to have them relaxed, not messing around, but there's probably music going. There's guys, there's four groups. Coach RC and I have a whiteboard that we bring out as all the, the groups and all the kids that are in each group. So they know where they're supposed to be at. And then it has round one, round two, round three. If we're taking round, if we're taking four rounds that day as, you know, it's scripted out. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're trying to do stacks here because we're doing base running those first rounds. So round, let's say round one, group one, you're hitting group two, you're base running group three, you're in the cage group four, you're at your position taking live reps off the bat. And then you got two coaches hitting fungo, but the only thing we take live is off the bat. 
So we have screens up everywhere to protect like first baseman or or at second base if we're turning two. And then we feed, we don't have that screen in center field where the bucket usually is. We'll feed the balls to right and left. That way the center fielder can work on, on those ground balls that are usually taken away at that screen. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, we try to, I try to be relaxed and then, and then I'm probably roaming somewhere. I'm probably in the outfield talking to guys or behind the infielders trying to get to know how they're feeling, getting to know, you know, what feels good, how they hit, how they think they did, you know, just trying to get a feel for it because on game day, that's important to me. And that's when we're doing BP most of the time. I like that getting a pulse for the team and yeah, that's something that's really good. And another thing that you mentioned that you felt like you did different this year was your in season lifts. And you mm-hmm. you talked about you guys obviously picked at the right time, but you said that that was right. you, that was something that you guys were trying to do different because it was something the last couple of years you you started to dip down at the end of the year, and this year you guys kept getting better and better. And so tell us a little bit about what you meant by that. Yeah, we uh, this was my sixth year at Santa Fe, and Every year, every year offensively, our numbers towards regionals and the state tournament have gone down from the middle of the season. So last year we made adjust, and so every year we've tried to make adjustments on on what we do, you know, hitting them more, hitting them less, staying away from them more. I don't know. We've just tried a bunch of different strategies, and every year it's kind of been, you know, we're, we're on the decline. Now we've had success, but our numbers are declining. And so this year, you know, I talked to some of our assistant coaches and I said, one thing we've never done in the season is, is continue lifting like we normally lift. Now we're not out there maxing all the time or anything like that, but we're actually lifting. We're actually running. We're actually, they're actually sweating. They're actually, you know, or like I said, coach Peeler, our weight training guy, he did a really good job. So if Marcy was playing, he would still lift them. He would still lift them. But he would understand, okay, they got a game, you know, and he started being more specific for each team. Freshmen aren't playing. All right, we're going to lift heavy today. JV, you got a game as well. So you guys are going to do the same lift as varsity. That's great. And this is the first year that at the end of the season, yeah, we had injuries, but our bodies were fresh. Our guys were fresh. Our arms were fresh. And I, I really do think it was because of how we changed how we lifted in season. Oh, I like that a lot, and I think there's a lot of correlation there. So you guys win mm-hmm. the state championship, and then you've got a couple of weeks before school is out. So what are your postseason meetings look like? And with the guys that just won it and are moving on, obviously that will be different than the guys that are coming back. But just getting a gauge on you talking about what your players are going to look like this fall and the different things that you're doing, I'm mm-hmm. assuming that – you guys had some different meetings with with your players in the program and what to expect this summer. And so talk to us about what you guys talk about in those meetings and then just give us some advice on, you know, why you go about it the way that you do. Communication, and, and, I, and I haven't said this much, but I think you get the point. Communication is big for us, not only among coaches, but coaches and players. And so our season ended later than it's ever ended. You know, we got to play a little bit longer than we've ever played. And so – we kind of had to, and then, you know, in the spring in Oklahoma, you have about, once the state tournament's over, you have like a week and a half. Some schools are done that week or whatever. So we had a week and a half to kind of get organized. And so something that we did this summer as well is we continued to lift. Monday through Wednesday, we did lifting. So the first thing we asked the guys is, what, what are your goals in the weight room? And we do that. We let them, we know what their goals should be. But we'd like to see if they're on the same thought as, as we are. If, if they're thinking the same thing, we're thinking about them. You know, a lot of them are like, yeah, I want to get stronger. I want to get a little bit faster. You know, and so we did a lot of that. We made sure we had a lot of that in the weightlifting. But we also want to know, you know, what are their not necessarily goals that they can't control? Because we don't do goals that, that they can't control. Like, oh, I want to be on varsity. Well, it's not really – their decision, you know, so we try to make our goals something they can attain by themselves, you know, because if you're trying to re- make goals that rely on other people and you don't have any control of, that's tough to do, you know, because it's going to be hit or miss sure. just depending on, on what that person thinks or that opinion. And it might be right or wrong, 
but then you feel like you failed on your goal. So we're making goals that they can control. You know, they want to get a little bit stronger. Okay, well, you can control that. You can you can work towards that. Or we, I want to work on my arm strength. Okay, you can work on that. And so that's what we ask. We're like, well, okay, personally, what do you want from mm-hmm. you next year? Sure. You know, where where do you where do you see you getting better at, or what do you see you need help with? What do you, you know? And so that's what a a player exit interview looks like. You know, and we do coaches ones too. Mm-hmm. This year is a little bit different. But I ask them, you know, if they're happy with their roles, I ask them if they want more, if they want less, I ask them, you know, what can we do different? What can we do better? What do we not need to change? That's good. And individually, I just meet with them. This year, it's been a little bit different. And it, some of it's through text message, some of it's through passing when we're out here doing field work together. But again, I want them and I need their opinions. It's not, you know, it's not like I just do it just to mark off, you know, check it off the list. It's, these guys have more, you know, they're around, they see stuff that I don't see. And so I need those opinions from them. So we do exit interviews for players and coaches. I like that a lot. And I think that that is, that's something that sets you apart. And you can obviously tell just from listening to you for 50 minutes that one, you have a heart for your players, but two, you have a real passion for developing your coaches and, you know, it sounds like if those guys are, are ready in the next couple of years, you'll have them prepared to be head coaches. And which mm-hmm. leads me to my next question. You know, we're going to start the lightning section of where we just do some different quick hitters. And so what okay. advice do you have for any first year head coaches that are listening or any assistants who want to be head coaches someday? This is a great question because I wish he would have told me this my first year, but I was listening to obviously Craig Groeschel's podcast and mm-hmm. There was a comment that says criticism is criticism is the price of leadership. Okay. So being a leader, you have to be yourself, but you got to also understand criticism. It's going to happen. And it kind of shocked me my first year because I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm the new head coach, you know, and I was the assistant coach and I was well liked at my previous school and, you know, I could do no wrong. But then when I came here as the head coach, the decisions are on you. But as long as you're being yourself, you just need to understand criticism is going to happen. So I just love the quote, criticism is the price of leadership because any leader anywhere outside, you know, not just coaches are taking criticism. And so as long as you don't fear criticism mm-hmm. and you embrace it and you try to understand it from the other side, that's the first thing you need to do, I think, as a head coach. Is understand that it's coming and, and prepare for whatever it is. Right. And I always like this question, too, because it's – it's something that everybody deals with it a little bit differently, but say that you get the dreaded parent email of, you know, why mm-hmm. is little Johnny not playing? <laughs> and you well, know, how, what what is your best advice on how you found as the best response to that? We have a 24 hour rule. So first off, that calms everybody down. I don't let them ask after game. And so if I get an email like that, I kill them with kindness, John. And I'm as kind as can be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell them I love their kid. I think, you you know, as long as, as long as it's just performance stuff, I usually do love the kids. And Mm -hmm. so I tell them I love them. I tell them, Hey, this is what I see he can work on. And I also tell them that I'm going to let the kid know that you emailed me, you know, and I let them know that before the season, I say, if you email me, I read the email to the kids because, you know, a lot of them are like, well, I don't want little Johnny to know I'm emailing, but blah, blah, blah. And so that kind of takes that away. And to be honest, I haven't had very many emails about, and I'm not going on wood, but I haven't had too many because I think that takes that away and, and it gives the kid the priority to come and talk to me about it, not the parent. I like that. And <laughs> that I may be stealing that from you in the future if I ever have that come about, because a lot of times I think, and you make it a priority to make sure that you communicate well with the players for them, if they have questions like that, like playing time, like why am I not playing to come to you in the first place. And so I'm sure that has a lot to do with why you're not getting a lot of those different emails, because I think we sometimes we paint ourselves into into a box whenever we decide we're cutting off all communication with yeah. with parents in general. And especially, right. you know, when you're communicating with the kid who's not playing on a consistent basis. I think that that, that right. always helps too. And that's something that, that I'm trying to get better at is just making sure you get a pulse for them, tell them they're doing it the best job they can, yeah. that they're probably just not better than the other person right now, but you're always there to help. And I think that helps because 
what happens in my experience is when you're not playing, you're looking for things to find that go wrong. And then the first person you go to when you're a teenager is your parents because they try and fix everything. And just off of my soapbox, what's something, because I say lightning style, but we're going to be here for 45 minutes if I keep keep going. (laughs) But what's something that you guys do in practice that your kids love? I think they like when I break the routine. I think they like when we just throw something random out there. We'll just, we'll make a game of something and we'll just go with it. Because baseball is a game of routines. You know, you're trying to, your game day routine, you like the consistency of it. But you also got to realize sometimes your routine breaks. And so you got to, you got to be able to adjust. And so that's kind of what I do in practice sometimes is we'll have a practice plan, but then we'll just completely go off of it and we'll, we'll make competition out of something and it will last long and it's going good and, and they like it and it's fun and we'll just go with it. And so, you know, cause you never know, you know, lightning delays or rain delays or an extra inning game in a tournament before yours, it can mess up your pitcher's routines. It can mess up your hitting routine. You might already be done hitting and then they go extras. And so I think it helps with that. Like you want your routine, but you got to, you also got to be able to adjust when you break a routine. And so, I actually think they kind of like the challenge of that. And I think they like, especially when it's something fun that we break the routine for. Okay. I like that. And if we came to one of your practices, what would be three things that you think that we would notice right away? One, we're running around, we're jogging around. Two, you got coaches out there coaching. They're not on a bucket. You know, you'd see five guys, six guys, seven guys out there coaching. Everybody's got something to do and everybody's, helping out. And then three, I'd hopefully you'd see kids having fun and enjoying the game and being challenged at the same time. Like we're not just all happy go lucky, but you got to enjoy it. There's a lot of pressure that goes in games and winning and during practice, it's got to be tough. You know, you got to challenge them. You got to have competitions, but competition's fun. You know, it's fun when you're winning. And those are the things you would probably see at our practice. That's great. All right. The last two, this one is is something that I've just started doing recently because we all have our biases. And what's something Mm -hmm. that you believe that other coaches may disagree with you about? I think you can do less. You know, I don't, I don't think you don't have to be out there a bunch. You know, we kind of talked about it with our hour long practice. Yeah. There's times where you do need to spend more time on it, but at our age and the, and the kids we're dealing with, I think less can be more you know, depending on what, what time of year it is. I know, you know, we don't practice. We didn't practice on the weekends this year, but that's the pulse I had for our team. And I'm not saying if you do, it's wrong, but mm-hmm. I just think sometimes coaches try to do too much on all aspects, not just length of practice. But I think sometimes you can outcoach yourself and, and it'd be too confusing for kids. So I think less can be more. Okay, I like that. And then finally... You're a guy who's well-versed in resources, and you've talked about the Craig Groeschel Leadership Podcast, which is fantastic and probably my favorite one that I listen to. But what are some other of your favorite books and resources that you'd like to recommend that our coaches check out? Okay, so we talked about this last time I was on, but I really like Own the Day. And it's different than, because you read a lot of leadership books on how to lead other people, Mm -hmm. but this one really kind of helps you lead yourself and focuses on yourself, which in turn makes you a better person and then makes you available to lead other people. But the Aubrey uh, and book. then the other one. Yes. Yeah. That's a good yeah. One. I liked it. And then the other one is chop wood, carry water. And this is one that like when I started reading and, and I didn't, I didn't start until later. And then you just kind of, you know, you fall in love with it, but this is one where if you feel like you're behind on techniques or on leadership, it gives you a lot of different, it's got short chapters and it gives you good pointers all the way through. It's almost like you've got to read it four times, mm-hmm. you know, or th- or two times or three times, depending who you are, mm-hmm. to get all of it that you can get out of it. Well, perfect. And that's the Joshua Metcalf book. I yes. Think. Okay, okay. It's cool. a good read. Cool. I read it uh, several years back, but from all accounts, it's a pretty good short read. And if you're looking for books right. to give to your players to and to go over them with them, I think that that's, that's one that, that a lot of people like. Right. One of my players has my copy right now, actually. Oh, nice. And, he, and he's reading it, so. Well, good. Well, Ryan, I, I appreciate you spending so much time with us today and just really opening up everything that you guys are doing at Santa Fe and 
And again, congrats on the, the state title. And it just shows how much effort that you're putting into your coaches who are putting into your players who, without a doubt, love playing for you. But if our listeners would like to get in touch with you and just ask you any questions about anything that we talked about today, what would be the best way to, to do that? Probably my best thing is the email. So Ryan, R-Y-A-N dot Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S at edmundschools.net. And I'll, I'll, I'll reply to anybody. Sure. Well, I'm just going to open up the mic for you. And is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? Yeah. If there's any athletic directors out there listening, they need to hire my man, John. You'll be a great leader one day. Um, actually, you're already a great leader right now. And I'm just excited for somebody who's going to give you that opportunity. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.